I am super excited for you to hear from my good friend, Gretchen Ronovic. Thank you. Thank you. It, I am so excited to be here. Um, I'm going to say in my firmest mom voice, since I saw my talk was um, titled Guiltless Rest, that this does not mean that you get to sleep through it. This is not the, the rest time. I think that when we are talking about rest, I, I posted this question on social media a while ago, is rest law or gospel? And it's something that I have thought about an awful lot. We can look to it for our freedom on when we are allowed to rest and when we should not rest or as a command when we must rest. Or we can look at it practically, how do we even rest? So I think first we have to look at a more fundamental question, what is rest? Are we talking about something physical or something spiritual? So I wanted to tell a story about my kids. This is about my older kids. They're 16 and 15 now. But uh, this is their favorite story. They love when I share this one. Um, so when they were about five years old and four years old, we were just, just had moved out to the farm. My oldest is a perfectionist. She loves everything beautiful. And this day she was working in her little play kitchen and she was making blueberry pie. And she had this invisible pie that she was pulling out of the oven and she had laid out a most beautiful tea party for dolls and teddy bears and she was getting it all set and she started cutting up this blueberry pie, this invisible blueberry pie. And her four-year-old brother said, can I have a piece? And she said, no, there, there is not enough. <laughs> and he started crying and he was just like, but I want a piece of this pie too. This is all set out. And he was kept getting louder and louder. And so it got to the point where I had to intervene because it was getting annoying. And I said, just, just give him a piece of pie. It's going to be okay. And she said, but I have not prepared enough for him. I have not prepared enough. There will not be enough for everybody. And she started dishing up pieces of imaginary pie onto the imaginary, uh, onto the plates. And he just kept getting passed by. And I said, just pretend you have more pie. Like, just uh, that's all you have to do. You just have to pretend that there's more pie. You don't even have to believe it. You don't even have to believe the pie is there. And so um, she said, I don't even have a plate. I am out of plates. <laughs> so I handed her an imaginary plate. And I said, cut an imaginary piece of pie and put it on this imaginary plate. And so she took the pie, the, the plate, and she put a piece of imaginary pie onto the plate, and I said, give it to him. And she looked at him, and with a smile on her face, she shoved it in his face. <laughs> and my little boy started crying as imaginary blueberry pie was going all over his hair and dripping onto his clothes. And he, this was the last piece of pie. He knew that there were no more. This was not redeemable. So I want to ask you a philosophical, or maybe it's a metaphysical question. Did my child sin? Was it technically sinning? Because technically the pie didn't even exist. She could say, where's the evidence that I sinned? He is clean. There's not even any evidence of pie. This was technically an argument between imaginations. So my, we tend to favor technicalities, to ask questions that address the technicalities. It's so black and white because we're looking for ways for self-justification. Technically, there was no pie on the plate, so no sin was involved. Technically, I was just thinking about it, but I didn't say it. Technically, I was just playing it out in my head, but it wasn't real. And the thing is, is that each one of us knows that sin was involved in that fight. We can't say no sin was involved it was just your feelings were hurt because it wasn't just feelings. We have this habit of putting everything we cannot see into this ambiguous category of feelings. And that's incorrect because faith is not a feeling. Hope is not a feeling. The Holy Spirit's work in our life isn't just goosebumps. The fact of the matter is there's a reality that exists that we are not privy to see with our eyes. And kids get this. 
We know that right and wrong go deeper than what we can see, what, what is temporal. This reality that God is trying to help us understand touches eternity and touches something eternal is like touching a live wire of electricity. We can't see the current, but we know it's there. When we're talking about faith or talking about belief, we are talking about things that we don't see. But I don't want you to think of this as feelings. When we talk about hope, it's about being so certain that something is real and that we wait for it with patient expectation. When we, when we talk about love or forgiveness or kindness or anything abstract, does the fact that, that they are abstract make it any less real? No, they're more than feelings. For example, Jonah knew that God wanted to save the Ninevites, but he wasn't really feeling it. You can be annoyed with your spouse as a feeling, but that doesn't mean that what is between you isn't more solid than passing emotions. Feelings are real in the sense that they are very chemical. They, um, they're affected by whether or not you've gotten enough sleep, whether or not you are under stress or hormones or what you ate that day. But love and faith and peace and joy, these aren't feelings. They don't originate within us in our current chemical struggle. They're something that comes from outside of us and dwells in us. And yes, does interact with our feelings, but they are a part of eternity and we can't always see them, but we know that they are there. We have trouble describing the abstract, so we give them symbols or God gives us something concrete to understand what is going on. Just like a wedding ring. A couple months ago, my husband lost his wedding ring for the first time. We've been married 19 years this summer. That wedding ring was a representation of our love. And now that it's missing, does that mean we're not married anymore? By no means. It's just a thing. It's just a symbol. When what we have between us is much deeper and more substantial, the ring served as a reminder of faithfulness, but the ring itself was not faithfulness. Many times what is seen is actually less solid than what is seen, than what is unseen. What is seen is just the reminder. So when we're going to talk about what is real, we are going to address both what is seen and what is unseen. And this is important because the topic we're talking about today is rest. I am the mother of six children. I have zero time to talk about theoretical rest. <laughs> I am literally tired all the time. I don't have energy to talk about rest of a philosophical nature. Are we talking about taking a nap? Yes. Are we talking about sitting down and putting your feet up? Yes. Are we talking about rest from the worries of our mind? Yes. Are we talking about peace in your soul? Yes. Because when we are talking about rest and what God thinks about it, I don't want you to think of it as physical rest, bad, spiritual rest, good. I want you to think complete, all encompassing, touching everything. He sees the sin in our hearts and our minds because he came to redeem not just what is seen, but what is unseen. None of the rest we are going to discuss today is theoretical. It's real. The passage that I chose for today is Hebrews chapter 3, verses 16, and we're going to go a little over into chapter 4. For those who, for who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. It was a couple of years ago, I did a, went deep in a study of Hebrews 
And that was one of the main questions I asked in a very exhausted part of my life. What is rest? What does it mean to enter his rest? In this context, when he's talking about Egypt and Moses, he's talking about the promised land. This is a historical context that the author is, is talking about. And it's interesting that he says that the people in the wilderness were not only given the law of Moses, but they were off, offered the good news of salvation by faith. And I didn't catch that when I read this story the first time. I'm, I'm, I mean, Chad probably caught it, but I didn't catch it. So let's rehash that for a second. God brought his people out from Egypt. He gave them the law. They broke it pretty much right away. And he brought them to the promised land and said, this is yours. When we know the promised land does not come from keeping the law, they were offered the promised land, but they didn't have faith. And it's not that they didn't enter the promised land because they broke the commandments. They didn't enter the promised land because they didn't believe God. The core of every sin is unbelief in what God had said. The core sin that keeps us from rest is not believing that God is who he says he is and God will do what he says he will do. The writer of Hebrews is trying to make a point that the gospel is not anything new. We are never saved through the law. God's faithfulness has always been greater than our own. Entering his rest is described as belief. He could have said promised land, but he used the word rest to describe the promised land. And that's really interesting to me. It probably didn't look like rest to the Israelites. They were probably like, you know, we were just slaves for 400 years. We're kind of tired. We have just done this long journey. We have been through a lot of stuff, a lot of trauma. When we believe that God would do what he said he would do and not charge in and do it ourselves, maybe they were thinking, yeah, but maybe he's not powerful enough or capable enough to do what he said he would do. Maybe it's gonna be left up to me. Maybe God said he's gonna do something, but really it's gonna be up to me to figure it all out. Maybe it's like code for God rooting for you or something. And I'm not strong enough to hold up God's promises today. So people will believe in him. I can't show off how good God is right now. I'm too tired to make that happen. Practically speaking, I can't make that happen for God. And I think we all can relate to that a bit. It says, enter his rest. So how does God describe rest? I am a classical homeschool teacher. We do timelines a lot. And so we're gonna get schooled a little bit on a timeline. I'm gonna give you a couple of pegs of God talking about rest. The first example we're given is in creation for six days, God worked and then he rested. For six days, he made light and darkness and land and seas and birds and bees. And on that sixth day, he makes man. And on the seventh day, he rests. And then what happens? I'm sure you're all familiar with the story. Adam and Eve didn't believe God and they had to leave the garden. We call this the fall. The world and all that was in it was broken. Before the law was given to Moses, there was another peg in the timeline. A promise was given to Abraham about the promised land. This covenant can be found in Genesis 17. God tells Abraham that he will be the father of many nations. He changes his name to Abraham. He gives him the promised land to Abraham and his descendants. And God said that he would do all of that and Abraham would keep his part of the covenant by circumcising himself and all the males in his household on the eighth day. So why the eighth day? This might be a little known fact in modern America, but the eighth day of a baby's life is actually extremely important. It's the day their bodies start producing vitamin K. And vitamin K is necessary for their blood to clot properly. Since a baby doesn't have vitamin K the first week of their life, if they've had any trauma in the birth or they were somehow get injured or cut, they could bleed out and it happens. My friend is a missionary in Africa and they have a tradition there to shave the baby's head with a razor on the eighth day in a naming ceremony because they won't name the baby before the eighth day because they don't know if it will live. 
In America, we give vitamin K shots. In Asia, they give uh, vitamin K orally, but sometimes some parts of the world's babies just die more often. The eighth day is when the bleeding stops. It's when parents are filled with hope that their child might live. So you can see how logistically circumcision was prescribed on the eighth day of a baby's life because of what was going on internally inside the baby. But God promised the promised land. That's why it's called the promised land. It's not called the earned land. God made a promise to a father and for lack of a better term, marked his fatherhood so that the, every baby was made, they would know that child was under the covenant. It was a very generational marking in, es- in essence. My oldest is at a Christian high school this year and instead of being homeschooled, and she took a class in Genesis this year and she's like, mom, I had a whole class in Genesis about circumcision. It was so embarrassing. I just wanted to die. And I said, man, I could talk about circumcision for hours. Let's go. Um, I said, next time they invite me to chapel, I should totally do a whole chapel on circumcision. She's like, don't do that. Mom, no, please. Um, next peg in our timeline, when God, people, when God brought his people out of Egypt, rejecting the promised land, and then giving him the ten, gave them the Ten Commandments, um, it reads like this. This is what it says about rest. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy." Notice how all-encompassing this commandment is. God doesn't say this about like murder and do not murder and don't murder this person or this person or this person or not everybody should murder or anything like that. It goes round and round. Here we see the extensiveness of Sabbath rest. It's a remembrance. It's a remembrance of what God has done, not something that we are doing for God. It's remembering what God did. There's an act of remembrance, something tangible attached to an unseen memory. It's for everyone. It wasn't for a particular gender or class or station or anything like that. It's like God takes the time to close up every single loophole of things that they could have said like he was talking to teenagers. No work? What about my wife? No. What about my kids? No. What if I train my animals to work? No. What about the homeless guy outside my house? No. Can I hire him to get the work done? No. In this commandment, God emphatically says that rest is for everyone. So let's think about the logistics of that because that's where my brain goes right away. I'm thinking of the logistics in my own life, in my own vocation. Does a nursing mother take the day off? Do you just not change diapers for the day? Like, how does this even work? How is rest even possible? My husband has a joke, I'll sleep when I'm dead. I mean, that's how it feels a lot of times. The only way Sabbath can truly be kept, can truly rest, is to be still, is to be dead. Something to look forward to. Let's get this straight. Israel never kept the Sabbath. They looked at the logistics and they could never figure it out. And so what they did with their guilt of not being able to do it is they made these mini laws that God never gave to appease their consciences. You can do this, but not this. You can walk this far, but not this far. Instead Instead of letting the law expose their inability, they brainstormed ways to sort of rest, but not really, but only for some. And we see this as we move along in our timeline to what Jesus said when he was approached because he couldn't care less whether or not he picked something on the Sabbath. He didn't care about their many laws. And not only, he said that the Sabbath is for man, not man for the Sabbath. Not only did they never keep the Sabbath, they didn't even know what it was for. They didn't even know why God wanted this for them. 
here's what I learn whenever I quote unquote take a Sabbath or put my feet up or decide not to work or at least arrange for some rest. Here's what I'm reminded of, that I am not God. When I let the dishes be undone, when I sit and watch the sunset, I'm reminded I'm not God. I don't cause the sun to rise and set. I'm not holding the world. I am being held by God. This remembrance is a way to love our neighbors. On our farms, this is probably gonna come across really legalistic, but on our farms, we don't work on Sundays. We have about 4,000 acres in the broader family up in Minnesota, and we don't plant on Sundays. We don't harvest on Sundays. And I'll tell you what, I don't think that I would still be married if we didn't have that rule for the farm. Um, people ask what it's like to live on the farm. I like to equate it to that show, The Crown, this family business where everything is done for the crown and the crown always wins. It's kind of like that. <laughs> All the extended family in the f- serve the farm. The marriage has been to the farm. The kids' activity has been to the farm. Our whole life bends to the farm, but on Sunday, the farm does not get to touch that day. It's where their power ends. It's my favorite day. To me, honoring the Sabbath is taking the gift of rest when it's offered. It's not about whether or not I walk out to my strawberry patch and say, oh, I can't wait to pick that strawberry tomorrow when I'm allowed to. It's, it's not about that. It's enjoying the gifts that God has given us. Working the land, the work will suck you in and it will never be enough. And it has to stop. Does it make you feel guilty to use a gift that God gave you? Is it hard? Is it that hard to believe that God is for you and for your good? It's humbling and yet sweet. Honestly, it's one of the most difficult parts of the Christian life, believing that God wants to give you something good. That can't be right. What if I didn't earn it? What if I didn't get my work done? I'll just wait until it's finished. No, resting is one of the best ways to remember that God's grace isn't something we earn, it's something we are given. We are promised. It is not for Him, it's for us. And that's just a taste. It's just something concrete to experience something deeper. Entering rest, true rest, is believing. It's remembering that God is who he says he is and God will do what he says he will do. It's not by our works. It's by faith in the living God that we enter into rest. The curious part of me wonders why we traditionally rest on Sundays. I mean, the farm, we pick Sundays because that's, that means we can go to church and we all want to go to church. And, but why does the church celebrate on Sundays? And I was, I was curious about that. I was wondering when in church history we started because you won't find anywhere in the Bible that commands us to meet on Sundays. So I looked it up and what I found was interesting. The first theologian to write on this was Justin Martyr, who was in the second, he was a second century theologian. So he wrote in like the 100s, really early in the church. And the short summary of what he said is the Jews celebrate the Sabbath on Saturday, but Christians celebrate it on Sunday because of the resurrection. It's the day Jesus rose from the grave after his death on the cross. But he goes further. And and this is the interesting part. He used the discussion of the Sabbath to dig into the circumcision party that was still hammering away at the Christians. Jews saying that you can't be in Christ unless you are circumcised first. The apostle Paul dealt with this circumcision party. The Jews who said, Christ is fine, whatever, but technically the covenant is is that we have to be circumcised as well. We're, we're finally believing in Christ, but let's make sure we cover our bases. We are saved by Christ and circumcision. It's impossible to be children of the promised land. They knew the story. I mean, you can't leave circumcision out of the equation, right? It's in the scriptures. Are you saying you don't believe the scriptures? Are you saying that 
some of God's word is important and another part isn't. I mean, that's what Paul deals with in the entire book of Galatians. Over and over, apparently this was still an issue decades later when Justin Martyr was writing. He said, and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna paraphrase this a little bit. If you, not only was circumcision a sign of the promised progeny that was to come, a generational marking that there would be someone coming, but Christ fulfilled both parts of the covenant, being a circumcised male himself and God providing the promised land. He came, not only that, but he came back from the dead on the eighth day. The promise that was to be filled on the eighth day was the resurrection of Christ. When you look at Holy Week, from the moment Jesus enters Jerusalem on a donkey, there is a parallel of creation account right down to the sixth day of creation. God, when God made man, Jesus broke his body for us. On the seventh day, when God rested, Jesus lay dead in the tomb, fulfilling the fullness of the Sabbath. And on the eighth day, the day of circumcision, the day of the promise, Christ rose again from the dead. But he goes further than that. He says that circumcision was a sign pointing to the redemption of Christ and does not in fact save. He says, if you claim you are saved through circumcision, then you are speaking of the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of rest being something that is only for males. He said that attaching circumcision to salvation would take women completely out of the theology of rest And we know God doesn't do that because of what he says about rest in the Ten Commandments. And we know that God's rest, God's redemption, God's grace, the belief that God is the one at work, we are merely bearing witness to his mighty hand to save when we are talking about holy rest, God's rest, the promised land, and no one has ever gotten there by the law. God said that his rest was for everyone, It was received through belief. For what does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. When we start attaching laws or favoritism, keeping this law over this law, modifying them, we are actually showing favoritism. Rest is for men and women, manservant and maidservant, son and daughter. When we attach anything Jesus plus, we start proclaiming salvation or even rest for those who are able. And we all have our favorite laws based on our ableness, based on our abilities or based on what we have to offer. We all have these laws that we're better at than others. So we figure, let's say that those are the laws that matter. And Justin Martyr destroyed that argument of the circumcision party not only saying that the resurrection happened on the eighth day, but saying you're talking about your salvation through circumcision. You're saying that God only made a a way to save certain people and women aren't one of them. God says in his command to rest, the promised land is our rest and no one will be left out of his rest. To understand rest is to understand that God is who he says he is and God will do what he says he will do. We do not hold his ministries together. He is holding us. We do not hold our families together. He is holding us. We don't have to worry if we are strong enough, capable enough, talented enough to enable God to keep his promises. God is who he says he is and God will do what he says he will do. Amen. Thank you.